Hello and welcome to the Dead Zoo's online talk series, Tales from the Decant. My name is Geraldine and I work in the Education Department at the National Museum of Ireland. And today I will be meeting with some of my colleagues to learn more about the important research and hands-on work they do at the museum. So please join us today for a giant topic, how to dismantle a whale. Today's talk has been pre-recorded and will last about 20 minutes uh, with some time after our speakers' presentations for questions. And a big thank you to everyone who responded to our colleague for questions and for sending them in to us. We will also be hosting a live Q&A via comments on the museum's Facebook and YouTube channels on Friday the 19th of March 2021 from 1 to 2 p.m. So please do get in touch. Now, without further delay, I would like to introduce to you our speakers. Please welcome natural history keeper, Nigel Monaghan, and zoology curator, Paolo Viscardi. And for today's talk, Nigel will be focusing on why the museum initiated a project to, to dismantle the whales, and Paolo will be explaining the details of how it was achieved. So big hello to you both, and thanks for joining us today. Hi, Jay. Okay. Hello. So we are very excited to hear your story. So let's dive right in. Nigel, I'm going to hand straight over to you. Okay, well, I'm Nigel Monaghan. I've worked in the Natural History Museum for almost 40 years. And my background and responsibilities mean that I have to look after the building as a whole, as the keeper of the museum. And we had to dismantle our whales. But before we get to that, there's a reason behind all of this. We're not just doing this for entertainment. It's been very hard work. It's also been very expensive and very time consuming, but it's part of a much bigger and more important project. The Natural History Museum on the left here is part of a suite of buildings that were built on this site as a purpose-built museum. On the right-hand side, you can see Leinster House, a stately home from the 1740s that was bought by the Royal Dublin Society back in 1815. And they had a small museum there, but they kept expanding and eventually they built a purpose-built museum on their grounds. Since then, the building was taken over by the state in the 1870s. And it meant that the state was funding the development of the museum and built some additional buildings in the gap between Leinster House and the Natural History Museum. Since then, the use of most of those buildings has changed. And in fact, the lecture theatre in the gap between the Natural History Museum and Leinster House is in fact Doyle Aaron. So the museum space on this site is relatively limited. It's limited almost entirely to the public space that many of the listeners will be familiar with. It didn't always look the way you might see it today. Um, if you came in in the 1860s when the museum was first filling up it only had certain floors filled. And as time went on, they had more money to develop more parts of the building, but they also had money to buy some really nice exhibits and install them into the building. One of the most significant exhibits by the end of the 19th century was a large fin whale skeleton that you can see hanging here on its own over the display cases from around 1890s or so. We know that the whale itself was hung up in 1892, but it was found in Bantry Bay in 1851. We know that the whale was bought at an auction. It was dismantled into the various bone elements in the sea, in Bantry Harbor, presumably, and then shipped literally up to Dublin with the help of the Coast Guard, who brought it up to the RDS premises, where it was processed to a degree on site and then hung up inside the building. It had in fact been assembled and put on the ground floor at one point, but by the 1890s, they had a plan to put it up into the uh, upper floor of the museum that you see here. As time went on, that floor filled with acquisitions. You can see a giraffe that's been added from the late 19th century. And also in the display case towards the front of the image here, you can see two large flippers of a whale. And that is our second whale. That's our humpback whale. And that skeleton obviously wasn't fully assembled by the 1890s. It had washed ashore 
in Sligo in 1892. So we know that this image showing the flippers must be around about that vintage. Later on, that whale was also suspended. And in fact, it's suspended from the same attic structure that holds up the large fin whale. We have an 1856 building. Some of it is very tired and seriously needs work. We've had running repairs on the roof. You can see here the uh, team uh, from the Office of Public Works carrying out roof repairs. And those roof repairs have become more and more common in recent years. There's been more and more work. And the roof basically needs a completely new outer layer. So that's the fundamental reason why we have to address this old building. It's part of a much bigger construction project that will take over the museum for the next few years. But initially, we're starting with the roof. So the roof of the museum, when you look at it from the inside, has a number of key features that we need to address. It has lovely big glass panes that allow in far too much sunlight. It has leaks. It has damp timbers, although it's structurally sound. But it also has big white metal frames that you can see in this picture. And those frames have the legs in the and shape of the letter A, you can imagine. Those legs are sitting on the outer wall of the building, and they're taking a great weight. And they're taking a great weight from these white triangles with the bars dropping down through into the exhibition. And those white triangles with those bars dropping down are holding up the fin whale. If you look up in this shot, you can see the fin whale at the top suspended over the humpback whale. So in order to deal with the major roof issues, we have to take out these big white steel frames. And in order to take out the frames, we have to take away the whales that are suspended from them. It doesn't stop there, because as Paolo will explain to you in a bit more detail, we have to empty a lot of exhibits for their own safety from this space. We also have to box in a lot of the dis big display cases to protect the glass. So it's been a fairly substantial exercise. And because we're doing it uh, 170 years later, um, health and safety and doing things very carefully is much more at the forefront. So it's taken a lot more time and effort, perhaps, than it might have taken to put the whales up there in the first place. The museum has had to close, uh, not just for COVID reasons, but it's had to close because these upper floors are basically a major work area. We will be reopening eventually, but at the moment our efforts are concentrated on dismantling the whales and removing exhibits from the balcony levels so that the major roof works can start hopefully later this year. In the meantime, you can visit this image as a 3D interactive tour. So you can actually go onto the museum website and surf around the upper floors yourself anytime you want. It doesn't look like this now, but Paolo will take you through what it does look like and all of the work that's been involved to date. Thanks, Nigel. That was fantastic um, and really nice to see those old images of the, the whales. Um, I, I wasn't aware of the image of the whale, the humpback whale fins. I hadn't noticed that before. So thanks a million for pointing that out and sharing them with us. So, um, Paolo, I'm going to hand over to you now so we can learn more about how you actually dismantle a whale. Uh, thanks, Jeanette. <laughs> Okay, so um, thanks very much, Nigel. It's really useful to be able to set the scene for um, how you know, we got to where we are now. Um, and what I'm going to do is kind of quickly run through well what we're doing. So um, dismantling a whale uh, takes a lot of planning. That's one of the things which um, I've spent a large portion of the first part of uh, last year doing was, was trying to get all the um, design in place for things like scaffolding um, because obviously when you've got whales the size of the fin whale which probably the skeleton weighs about three tons um, you need to be really careful about how you access it because you need to physically get up to that height 
um, which you know, obviously requires quite a lot of scaffolding and you have to you know, consider the safety factors involved in that. But also you need to deal with the weight. Um, and those two things are quite complex in a very, very busy space like we have in the museum here. Um, and so we had to do things like scan uh, the whales so that we could get very precise measurements for them um, to make sure that we'd be able to actually move them in the space because there's no point in getting the whale down if you can't then move it through the building without having to move other things out of the way. So we needed to know what was going to have to move before the whales could move. And we also had to plan what was going to have to move to allow the scaffolding to come in and to be put in place. Um, and so the first thing we did before kind of having to worry about putting in scaffold or anything was to actually put in some protections for the cases. Um, Nigel referenced this. It's quite an important part of the, uh, the museum space um, are the historic cases. Uh, they're mahogany, they're glass, they've been there for over 100 years. Um, they're beautiful. They're also really, really heavy. Um, so they're not the kind of thing you can very easily move. Um, and also they have a huge amount of collections in them. So we have around 10,000 objects on display in this building and um, they vary from kind of tiny insects right the way up to the whales themselves. So um, there's an awful lot of stuff to move and we just don't really have time to be able to move everything before we need to get the roof repaired because of the, the situation with the water. It takes a lot of time to move collections. And so casing everything in and adding case protection uh, was a, an important move, not just to, to help uh, protect the glass, um, from things like scaffold poles, uh, from knocking through it while, while the scaffolding is being erected, but also um, to help protect from things like dust and any water that might be coming in from the leaking roof while the work's taking place. Um, the timber platform that we used to access the humpback whale um, was, was really useful. So basically, when we put the case protections on the cases, some of the cases just had quite a light protection um, to prevent things like the scaffold bars from going through the glass. But the ones directly underneath the whales, because the cases were so close to the whales themselves, we didn't really have room to put in um, a scaffold for the first whale. We had to actually make a platform that was going to be strong enough to take people standing on it, working on it, and laying out all the bones from the specimen. So um, we, we had a really, really solid uh, structure built for that. And that allowed us to actually work on the specimen very easily. It was, it was a really useful addition. Um, although we did have to use things like mobile scaffold towers to get in from the sides uh, to be able to get above the, uh, the, the specimen because these things are suspended. The actual humpback whale was suspended from two chains hanging through from the fin whale above it. And so we had to stabilize that to stop it from swinging around and making the, the gigantic fin whale above it swing around as well, which is quite scary if you're underneath it. Um, getting rid of the humpback whale was relatively straightforward because the way it had been put together was, was, was quite simple. It was a single steel bar that went for the full length of the uh, specimen. The skull was on one end, the vertebrae had all been uh, threaded onto this, this single piece of metal. Um, and then the things like the ribs had been wired on to the uh, to another bit of steel and kind of attached into the rib, into the vertebrae. So it meant that it was a reasonably easy structure to take apart. Um, and that, that happened quite quickly. When we came to the fin whale, um, we hadn't had a chance to really have a good look at how it was put together um, before we got started because it was so high up um, and so far away from, from the balconies. So you couldn't get up close to have a really good look at it. And one of the things that we did notice um, in advance was that uh, you couldn't see how it had been put together because there were these big plaster kind of blocks between the vertebrae, the backbones. Um, which obviously uh, left us guessing how it was going to be put together, which um, meant that we, we we basically had to make a plan once we got up close to the specimen. Um, and so in order to do that, we built a large scaffold platform. And that platform had to be able to take the weight of the whale um, as it was being suspended from big gantries, these big kind of um, square-shaped structures which can take the weight of large objects. Um, they can take up to two tonnes each, depending on the size of the gantry. So um, we ended up using three of those. And those things are heavy. Um, so that, the whale, plus those gantries, plus things like mobile scaffold towers, which we needed to get access to the, uh, to the actual specimen. And of course, all the people working on it, it's, it's actually quite a lot of weight being put on there. So the scaffold that was installed is really heavy duty and um, lots and lots of steel. And actually, in order to be able to make that work, um, we had to connect through and um, back prop to the ground floor so that the weight wasn't all going on the floor upstairs. We had to spread the weight right the way through the building. Um, now, this is uh, an image of the fin whale skull suspended from a couple of the gantries. And we, we had to use quite a lot of lifting equipment in order to make sure that we could move it up and down once we got to the, 
the point of getting the rest of the skeleton off. And, and getting the rest of the skeleton off was, was interesting. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but in order to be able to support that specimen, we used a lot of lifting straps. These are these really strong um, kind of uh, nylon straps, which they can take, depending on the, the type, they can take over, you know, over a ton or two tons, depending on what they're rated for. And we also used an awful lot of chains. And those will be connected up to winches, electric winches and manual winches. And the electric winches um, are, are very useful because they allow you to move things you know, very easily. You just push a button and they move. But they're quite fast. Um, and actually, it means that you don't have much control. So we actually relied more on the manual pulleys where you have these big long chains and you're, you're kind of constantly moving them. They make a huge amount of noise, um, but they give you a very fine control on how you move things up and down, um, which when you're not moving it far is great um, because uh, you, you've got the control. But as soon as you're moving over a large area, it becomes um, quite a lot of work because it takes time and it's all you know, manual labor. You're physically having to do it with your arms. So taking the actual specimen apart was um, was much harder when we got to the fin whale than it was for the humpback whale. We couldn't just like pull the vertebrae off uh, a single steel rod like we could before, um, because the way in which it had been constructed was uh, a little bit bizarre. And um, there was an awful lot of plaster, and um, we were expecting it to all be skeleton. We were expecting it all to be bone, but actually the ends of the tail um, were all made of plaster. Uh, the front of the uh, the skull was made mostly of timber with a thin layer of plaster over it. And even the flippers um, contained wood and plaster and bone. And that's because while the animal was dead at sea, um, it, it's likely that it was decomposing. And so either bits of bone were dropping off and just being washed away, or they were getting to the point where they were so unpleasant and uh, kind of mouldy and nasty that they didn't want to put them on display. So they either cast them or used another museum specimen probably and cast bones that out of plaster, which were really realistic. Um, really, really well done casting in plaster. Um, and that's what was on the specimen. But to get it off was horrific. So we had a couple of guys over from the Netherlands um, and uh, uh, and actually there was someone uh, over from uh, the west coast of Ireland as well. Um, there's a company called All, uh, Inside Out Animals. And they were the ones that took apart the, the two different whales. Um, and you know, they were amazing. They did a really fantastic job, but they did a huge amount of work on that fin whale. Um, so Karen and Michael were in there with, with a saw and they were in there with hammers and chisels trying to get these vertebrae separated away from the steel bars. That, that there were lots of steel, steel bars all kind of joined together to create the full length of the animal. Um, it was an awful, awful lot of work, but they did an amazing job. Um, and so as they worked through, um, they kind of took the same approach as we did with the uh, with the humpback quail. Um, you start from the extremities, you take the fins off first, then you take the ribs off, then you take off the vertebrae, and then you're left with the skull, which comes down usually um, relatively easily because once you've taken everything else away, it's just a floating structure there, which is on gantries. Um, but it is heavy. So the, the skull of this particular whale was... The lower jaw was around 360 kilos. The top part of the skull was around half a ton. So all told, it's about three quarters of a ton or more. Or more. Um, it's, it's a huge amount of weight to be dealing with suspended from a, a roof. Um, but we managed to get it down. Um, again, it's just a case of using the... Uh, um, the gantries, the lifting structures, lifting chains, everything, an awful lot of people uh, working very hard to make sure that everything moves slowly, carefully, and without causing any damage to the objects. Um, and once it was down, we had to figure out how to actually get it out of the building, which largely meant uh, building a, a timber frame, which was able to take and take the weight of the half-ton skull um, and support it all the way around. Um, and then that had little wheels underneath it and they were able to be uh, the whole thing was able to be wheeled by just three people um, very easily um, to a window so the only way to get these things out of the building were to actually go out the window um, and in order to do that we had to remove the window frame um, there's an awful lot of work involved in that and we had to put a scaffolding outside of the building um, but because of all the careful preparation lots of measurements and, and some very good carpentry from, from the team here, the Morris Ward team have been working on uh, the project. Um, we were able to get a perfect fit out of the window with the large skull. Um, and then uh, the guys from uh, from Tracy's um, guy called Jack, who's a train op uh, crane operator, managed to lift it down safely. So I'll just finish up with a, a short video of that crane actually uh, doing the work to lift that large object down. Um, and this video, um, it, it will take quite a long time to show you in its 
its full length because um, you have to move very, very slowly when you're dealing with weights this heavy. Um, and it's, it's very difficult to kind of uh, to move something of that size without bits dropping off, without um, things potentially breaking. And so in order to do it safely, you, you have to just go really really slowly and also the frame was built using you know, really solid wood um, and really large bolts um, just to make sure that there was enough strength in that frame to suspend a half ton weight from it but everything went perfectly and um, the specimen was um, just put straight back into the back of a truck and was able to be taken to our off-site storage facility where it will be waiting for us to finish doing the building work um, and hopefully we'll be able to put it all back in again and cleaned up, conserved and looking great uh, at some point in the future. Thanks very much. Fantastic, Paolo. Thank you so much. Again, another great presentation there and a real, real good insight into the a day and at the office for a curator. <laughs> um, so some time, we have time for questions. Um, so we actually were sent in some questions from people who wanted to learn more about the project and about our whales. So I will start with them. And Nigel, these questions are for you and they're a bit about, they're about whales in general. So one person wants to know how many bones are there in a whale skeleton or in our fin and humpback whales? Well, basically, there's a variety depending on the species, but you're talking about 180 bones. If you think about it, an awful lot of mammals have similar numbers of bones because they have fundamentally a similar design of skeleton, even though they come in so many varieties. Um, you'll see the same number of bones in the forearm of a human as you will in an awful lot of other animals. If you think about it, whales are missing the back limbs. There are some small bones that relate to the pelvis area, showing that they are descended from ancestors many millions of years earlier who would have had back legs. Um, so whales have slightly fewer bones than humans, around about 180 compared with the 206 for an adult human. Fantastic, thank you so much. And another question about whales. Well, you did mention where our whales um, were stranded, where they came from, but do we have any and how old they were and what stage they're like. Basically, the, the, one of the ways to um, assess the age of an animal at death is to look at its level of development of the bones and in also mm -hmm. the total length. So the fin whale was pretty close to as big as fin whales get. Um, we know the measurements of it when it was dead because they were quoted in a newspaper when it was up for auction in 1851. And uh, we know at that length, it is pretty close to a fully mature animal, but they do live long lives. So you're talking about tens of years to get to that full adult size, but they can live as long as humans. With the humpback whale, we know it's much younger. It's a sort of an adolescent, close to fully mature female, but not full size. Um, we know a bit more about the fin whale because it died uh, much later and it was written up by scientists and examined and studied at the time, whereas the fin whale, not very much was noted about it at the time. We can also look at the level of development of the vertebrae on the humpback whale and the discs that join up and make the spine more solid as the animal gets older were still not fully um, connected to each other. So in fact, we had a lot more individual discs of bone than the number of about 180 would suggest. So there was an awful lot of labeling of those bones so that when we come to put them back together, we'll manage to do it in the right sequence and make sure everything goes back the way it came out. Well, I'm glad you, you pointed that out because that was a, a question that came in from a few people is like, how do you keep track of this? Um, and actually, Paolo, uh, some questions for you. Um, now you did talk uh, a lot about how all the bones were assembled. Um, but we were, but one person was wondering, when you were dismantling the whale, did you drop any parts of it? <laughs> Which I thought um, was a good question. It's a, it's a good question. Um, I don't think any <laughs> bits were, were dropped as such, but there were certainly <laughs> some, um, some of the bits between the vertebrae which were just chiselled out. Um, so effectively, they, they were treated more or less as rubbish um, because you know they. they were broken bits of plaster which were no longer going to be usable. Um, I wouldn't call that part of the main specimen there because it's not bone and it's not actually the plaster vertebrae which had been cast. It was just filler. 
Um, so it's kind of drawing the line between what you consider part of the specimen and what you consider to be um, you know, a real bit of object. Um, it, it's it's, it's a, a semantic argument, really. Uh, but, <laughs> but basically, um, I don't think anything got dropped. Uh, nothing that I'm aware of anyway. Not, not unless it was stuff. deliberate. The only dropping happened with uh, chains on, so it dropped very, very slowly and in a controlled way. Perfect. Very good. And um, so, yeah, I, I saw in some of your fantastic images that you had labelled the specimens, all the bones, carefully. And you mentioned that they have been brought into storage. And I suppose some people were wondering, like, what will happen to the whale skeletons? Like, did you, are they just boxed away now? Or did you have to assemble it in some way to help? Uh, you mentioned there's going to be a cleaning process and conservation of it. Yeah, um, so they've all gone out to our off-site storage facility and uh, we have an awful lot of shelving out there, long span shelving. So the vertebrae, um, after they've gone through the process of being frozen um, to kill any pests, um, because you know, we don't want to bring any pests that are left in this building over to our storage facility, it's the last thing we want. After they're frozen, mm -hmm. they come out and then they go onto shelves. Um, and obviously they're all labelled so we know exactly where they belong. So to a certain extent, it doesn't matter so much where they are. We don't need to put them together uh, to keep track of them because we have an electronic database, um, a, a collections management system, which allows us to keep track of where things are. So um, generally it's it's fairly straightforward to actually find things in the museum because we, we do actually have a record of where things have, have gone. Um, but certainly we, we you know, most things will stay together. The skull, however, is too big to go with the rest of the skeleton. Uh, the rest of the skeleton and will fit on shelves, no problem. But that big skull um, is in its own crate. That crate has been built um, to allow it to be stored in that in that particular container. And it means that because it's on wheels, it can be moved out of the way if it needs to be. So that's stored with some of our other large objects uh, and not in the natural history collections at all. Great. Well, thanks so much. And I just want to say thank you because your presentation, both your presentations today have answered a question that was regularly being asked of uh, of me in, and, and, and Emma during our regular tours from kids and adults, which is, how did they get the whales up there? And we didn't, you know, we, we could only kind of speculate because there's no images as such, but now we definitely know how the whale was dismantled and we can give them a lot of detail and provide images. And I, I think um, the, the public will really enjoy your presentation today. So thank you so much. We, we're running out of time now, so we're going to finish up. But thanks a million to both Nigel and Paolo for a fantastic talk. And a big thank you to everyone who tuned in today. And just a reminder that there will be a live Q&A via comments with Nigel and, pa Nigel and Paolo um, on our Facebook and YouTube comments. Um, and that will be from 1 to 2 p.m. on the 19th of March. So we look forward to seeing uh, your comments and questions then. And just to let you know, guys, that this was the first talk in our online series, Tales from the Decant. So there will be further talks. So please like, follow, and subscribe to the museum's Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter channels to receive the most up-to-date news on upcoming events and resources. And finally, if like me, you are missing the dead zoo, why not pop onto museum.ie? Like Nigel mentioned earlier, we have a 3D virtual visit where you can explore the galleries of the dead zoo from your own home, and you can even get right up and close to those whale skeletons. So that's that's all for now, folks. So thanks a million, and see you next time. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Nigel. Thanks, Bella. <laughs>